Hello, I'm Thomas Cleveland, the Director of Academic Programs at the Jack Miller Center, and welcome to our webinar, uh, Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremes. It's going to be a conversation with uh, Professor Stephen B. Smith, Alfred Cowles Professor of Political Science at Yale University, a longtime friend of the Jack Miller Center. I'd say if um, Patriotism means both uh, commitment to our founding principles and very heated debate about them. Uh, uh, Professor Smith is a good example of that form of patriotism. We're always happy to work with him. Um, I just wanna say a couple of things before we get started properly about the format. This is recorded and it's gonna be um, on uh, YouTube at some point. Um, so I just wanna warn you about that. If, you, if you're uh, wary of your question being on the internet in perpetuity to be remembered for all time, you know, maybe you want to be reticent in putting it forward. But at the same time, I want to encourage you to engage. Uh, there are two ways you can engage. One is to put a question in the Q and A box. If you do that, I will relay the question uh, to Professor Smith. Um, another way to, to engage is put your, use the hand uh, up feature, uh, which should be in your Zoom menu, raise hand feature. And I will allow you to talk at my discretion uh, so you can ask your question live. So I, I do wanna encourage you to put your questions in early and often uh, now, as a, oh yes, one more, um, one more uh, thing to note. If you registered, you saw that we're going to be offering five copies of the book to lucky attendees. Uh, we're going to send notice of the, to the winners tomorrow, uh, supposing that you actually attended the event because you've got to, you've got to commit to, to be worthy of such a prize. Um, now we have a poll, 17 of you answered. The question was, are you a patriot? Luckily, uh, we had all 17 who answered, declared themselves to be patriots. Uh, it also means insofar as we have 22 attendees, some people refuse to answer yes or no. And maybe we have some questions for such people. Uh, but nevertheless, all who decided to stand up and be counted uh, are indeed patriots. And uh, uh, with that, actually, I just want to turn it over to uh, Professor Smith, and we'll see what he has to say uh, about this important, interesting matter. Uh, thank you, Tom. And in fact, thank you, everybody. Uh, I want to thank the Jack Miller Center, and especially Tom and Lauren for setting this event up, making it possible. And I'd like to thank all of the attendees, although I can't see any of you. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to, uh, to join me for this conversation about patriotism. Uh, Tom began the webinar with this poll about, uh, you know, are you a patriot or not? That in fact, uh, and 100%, uh, at least of those who responded, said yes, although not 100% of everybody who was there, uh, was here. About two weeks ago, I was invited to present my thesis at a meeting of the Yale Political Union, which is the you know, political debate society on campus comprises all of the variety of political parties from left to right on the Yale campus. And the question put before the house was about reclaiming patriot patriotism should be reclaimed. Uh, there was a heated debate uh, for and against. And at the end of the uh, meeting, there was a vote on the proposition before the house. And I was delighted that the motion carried. A majority of Yale students voted in favor of patriotism. That was the good news. The other side of 
the coin possibly is that the motion carried by a single vote. So, you know, one, one, is, a, one is as good as a thousand, I suppose, but uh, it carried uh, barely, uh, much better than the Oxford Union debate, a famous or infamous debate of 1933. Anyway, patriotism. Um, patriotism, I argue in the book, is a sentiment inseparable from political life, love of country is something that has been taught by all of the great political philosophers of the past. Although one of the things that led me to begin thinking about this book is that it is something rarely discussed today among students of political science, political theory, history, and the like. If we could be meeting together, I would propose the following as a little test, but since we can't, I will just, I'm gonna read four quick quotations. And I would typically ask, who do you think said it? I'm sure everybody will know these immediately, but I'm gonna read them anyway. Four, four sentiments about patriotism written by writers of the past. Number one, I love my country more than my soul. Who said that? Of course, everybody knows that was Machiavelli in a letter to his friend Francesco Vittori. I love my country more than my soul. Number two, whenever I meditate upon government, I always find new reasons to love my own country. That might be a little more obscure, but that is from the very beginning of Rousseau's social contract. Number three, which I think will be familiar, to make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. Edmund Burke from the Reflections on the Revolution in France. And probably my favorite quotation on the question of patriotism is the following. He loved his country partly because it was his own country, but mainly because it was a free country. And of course that was Abraham Lincoln in his eulogy for Henry Clay. And I think in many ways that said more about Lincoln's views or than it did maybe even about Clay's. But these all led me to think that patriotism is something worth reconsidering again. And it was surprising that when I began thinking about it, how, again, how little there was to go by, at least among our contemporaries. The best piece, written on patriotism in the last you know, many years or so is what has become a kind of famous essay by Alistair McIntyre called Is Patriotism Virtue? Uh, it's an admirable essay. I discuss it and also criticize it in my book, but it helped to reinvigorate an issue, the issue of patriotism, at least among moral philosophers. And that was to some degree, both its strength and its weakness. It treats patriotism as a kind of case of moral philosophy. And the question that McIntyre posed was whether it was morally justified to have preferences for your own country, as opposed to general or universal preferences. And he argued that these were two competing and in many ways contradictory theories of morality and that they would always necessarily be in conflict with, with one another. The universalist tendency that he tended to associate with modern kind of Kantian or neo-Kantian ethics and a kind of moral particularism that uh, perhaps has its roots in Aristotle, but also you know, has many, many, uh, many uh, exponents. And the question was, again, is it, is it morally permissible to offer preferences to your own? And his answer was a kind of qualified yes. My book begins, in fact, not with a twofold distinction between whom I call a universalist and particularist morality. I want to look at, at patriotism along also in many ways along Aristotelian lines. 
I put patriotism on a continuum, as Aristotle discusses the virtues, as a virtue is a continuum of, between excess and deficiency and ethics and virtue as a matter of finding the right uh, middle midpoint in some way. And I treat patriotism in much the same way. I think it's a useful way to think about patriotism, uh, to think of it in terms of what stands on its different sides. It's, you might say, its excess and its deficiency. Let me start with the deficient or the uh, uh, side, the, the, which is to say the side which kind of exhibits uh, lack of patriotism or question of patriotism. And that's the view of cosmopolitanism, uh, a view that has roots in the ancient world. It's not a new thing by any imagination, it goes back to Diogenes, Could, in some ways goes back to Plato, but uh, Diogenes, the Stoics, they thought of themselves and the citizens of the world was the famous uh, expression. They were part of the cosmopolis of, hu of humanity, not simply the polis, but the, the cosmopolis, and saw themselves as um, having obligations first and foremost to a kind of humanity, of humanity. And that was a view that in many ways has been very powerful in the Western tradition. It's many, many different exponents in modern world, uh, of course, most probably most famously associated with Kant, Immanuel Kant, who saw our moral obligations as being, having a universalist character, uh, that we have obligations to humanity uh, with no particular preferences for country, for ethnicity, for any of the other particularisms that, that, that shape us as, as individuals, but our obligations must be thought of as part of a, a moral law applicable to all people everywhere. And a noble uh, vision to be sure. And of course Kant, Kant's form of cosmopolitanism has received different forms of different iterations in the um, contemporary world, probably his, the most famous or the most well-known of the advocates for this view is, is the U of Chicago philosopher, Martha Nussbaum, who has very vigorously argued for a kind of globalist cosmopolitanism. Although I believe she has walked some of that back recently, nevertheless, she is the kind of um, exhibit A usually of this, of this position. That's kind of easy one distinct to distinguish patriotism from cosmopolitanism. It becomes a little more difficult to distinguish patriotism from what's on the other side of the continuum, what I call the excess of patriotism, which I describe as nationalism, because nationalism and patriotism are clearly much more closely related, although one of the central theses of my book is that these are in fact two quite distinct things. Uh, you know, we have two different words for them. They come from different roots. Uh, they come from, they derive, I think, from different histories in, in, in many ways. Uh, I won't go into that now. Um, uh, it's discussed at some length in my book. I'll be happy to talk about it uh, if you like. But nationalism, as I argue, is a, in many ways, distinctively modern modernist uh, ideology uh, arising in the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, it was probably its first kind of self-conscious articulator was the German philosopher Johann Gottfried Herder, who advocated what we might call a kind of linguistic nationalism. He was impressed by the different languages, national vocabularies, national languages, poetries that shaped human beings. Uh, for him, language was not just an instrument for achieving ends. Language was an expression of what a people and a culture are, and it gives them form and shape. That was nationalism in its earliest and you might call liberal form of nationalism. And it endorsed a kind of moral pluralism, a kind of pleasing variety of peoples and nations that 
Herder thought were all part of a, also a kind of global humanity too. Um, he was not opposed to the idea of having a kind of universalist view, but he just thought that humanity received its articulation in these different linguistic and national forms. Nationalism took a very different turn in the 20th century, especially in the period after the First World War. Again, it's a long, it's, it's, it's a long political and historical story, but nationalism, as I argue in my book, became eventually a tool for, it became an ethnic uh, expression of ethnicity, and it became a tool for distinguishing ins from outs. Who was, who was part of the nation, who wasn't, uh, who was a friend, who was an enemy, who was us and who was them. And I wanna argue that nationalism, that kind of nationalism, we can call it ethnic nationalism, but nationalism sort of through a logic of its own becomes an ideology of us and them. It feeds on sentiments of anger and resentment it requires the identification of what we might call others, uh, others, whether the, uh, those others are foreign nationals or domestic others who fall outside the dominant ethnic or racial majority. Uh, we all know this type of argument. It's become very, very familiar again after going into hibernation for quite, for quite a while. It has, it has resurfaced again. Uh, and national, this kind of nationalism, we, we see uh, growing movement in many, many parts of the world, uh, Hungary, Orban, in Russia, in China, uh, in Brazil, Bolsonaro, and I have to say in America too, clearly, uh, there is a revival of nationalism, something that wasn't even really on the discussion five or six years ago is all of a sudden resurfaced. And what I wanna argue is that nationalism represents a very different kind of language and a different turn from patriotism. They begin from a sort of common root or premise, the desire to have your way of life and your culture strong and respected. It's a, I mean, it was a natural and um, certainly legitimate uh, expression or des desire but they move in different directions. Patriotism is a sense of, based on a sense of loyalty and gratitude, loyalty to who we are, gratitude for making us what we have become. But loyalty and gratitude are one side of the coin and those are also, are combined necessarily with a sense of shame when we fail to become who we are or become what we think we ought to be. Uh, gratitude and shame are two sides of patriotism. One of the things that I argue in the book, uh, and this is sort of the second main, main point of the book, uh, is that American patriotism is unique. Uh, there is, I, I'm not offering a theory of patriotism in general. It is really address to and for an American audience. And what makes American patriotism unique also is a kind of twofold quality. Uh, ours is uniquely, I think, uh, I can be corrected on that to be sure, but I think ours is uniquely a, what I would, what I call in the book, a form of principled patriotism. Our patriotism is dependent and derived from certain principles uh, of the kind that will obviously be very familiar to uh, participants in Jack Miller programs and seminars, the principles of Republican government, uh, the, those principles embodied in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and our, and our governing documents, uh, principles like equality, liberty, separation of powers, limited government, you know, on and on. You, you all know this very well by now, of course. These are a kind of Republican principles. And they are inscribed into the nature of American patriotism. Uh, when children uh, say the, I mean, when they say the Pledge of Allegiance in school, I think they still say it, 
What do they pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. School children don't know what a republic is, much less really what it stands for, but there is the idea there and to the republic for which it stands. Our patriotism is principled, or to put it another way, which is a more familiar way perhaps of putting it, we, our, our patriotism has what Samuel Hunt, great political scientist Samuel Hunt called a creedal dimension to it. We are a creedal people. Uh, we are a people with a creed and that creed even predates the constitutional founders. It goes back to the earliest founders, the Puritans who thought of themselves as people of the book who brought with them books and thought of themselves as establishing a new Jerusalem in, in the wilderness, in, the, in, in, in this New England wilderness. Um, from the beginning, our patriotism and our focus has had a, a principal intellectualist character to it, an aspirational character to what we might, not only what we are, but to what we might become. And I think that is a crucial aspect of American patriotism. And I am afraid or I fear of it, of it getting lost. Ours is not simply patriotism to land and soil, blood and soil of the kind that we're kind of more familiar with in its European varieties, but perhaps in a nation of immigrants who often have no clear history with, with land and soil, what we have is the creed, the, something like the American creed that shapes who we are. And I'm, I'm gonna end on this note, I'm going on, I may be going on a little too long. We are not only, I mean, patriotism, I said it has a dual dimension. Patriotism is certainly largely creedal and aspirational, but our patriotism is also, also what I call in the book an ethos. If you wanna use kind of, as I, do at one point kind of fancy terms for this. Our patriotism is a combination of both logos and ethos, of both principle and a kind of rooted in ethos and sentiment and habits, in common dispositions, in our language, in our literature, in our cuisines, these kind of sub-political or pre-political uh, um, uh, dimensions of what of the what you might call the American way of life, uh, of the American Republic. We are not just a, we are not simply defined by uh, our constitution and our laws. We are defined by an ethos. We might say by a culture of habits, dispositions, moral sentiments. I I like this kind of 18th century language of moral sentiments and habits uh, to describe what I call ethos patriotism. And the book ends with a list of practices uh, around which I think um, what I call enlightened patriots today can coalesce. Um, how we can defend patriotism without either falling into the idea that it is from the from the usually from the left side of its spectrum, seeing it as just a kind of atavistic uh, defense of 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 one's own, uh, and falling on the right wing side that sees patriotism again as kind of an angry denun denunciation uh, and a drawing of lines between who's an American and who's a real American and, and who's not. Uh, so uh, I could go on, but I think I've gone on too long already. So Tom, maybe uh, we'll turn this over to a Q&A and see where, see where things go. Yeah, thank you so much for that very concise summary of the book. And I, I would like to, to recommend uh, to folks who have not had the chance to read it, uh, to really pick it up. It's, it gives a historical and theoretical overview of the, the concept and um, there are also funny bits. Uh, there's a, a definitive list of which American figures are cool and uncool uh, that, 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 uh, that deserves uh, reflection, <laughs> probably debate. Um, uh, but uh, leaving that aside, it, 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 um, and in addition, it has this practical dimension that you, that you mentioned in, the, in your closing that uh, you have something like advice about what, what's worth uh, 
rallying around or what's fo worth focusing on. Um, uh, so I just wanted to say that. I wanted to begin with um, the distinction you, you laid out at the beginning, that there are three concepts here. It's not just cosmopolitanism versus patriotism, but it's also cosmo uh, patriotism versus nationalism. At some point, I think you call them opposites. And I guess I just wanted to have you elaborate on that a little more. Um, at one point, I think you say that patriotism satisfies the human need for belonging and uh, for service and for the love of one's own. And reading that, one might say, well, nationalism satisfies that as well. How come that isn't just as natural? But you really do attempt to say, no, nationalism is not a natural human sentiment. Or um, So I guess I, I just want you to, to spend a little bit of time uh, making that distinction. Uh, Thanks, you... Fred. Actually, let me just make a, a, a correction, I think, in the way you um, um, framed my argument. Uh, I, I said uh, at one point, uh, going back to a speech that Emmanuel Macron, French President Emmanuel Macron made on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day. He, he said that nationalism and patriotism were the opposite. He said they were opposite. And in fact, that was a, a line or that was a, picked up and restated uh, by the Harvard historian, Jill Lepore mm -hmm. in a piece that she wrote. And I argued, in okay. fact, they're, they're wrong in saying they're opposite. Right. Uh, I don't want to say, in fact, I, my idea of a continuum, uh, I had mm. friends who, uh, when I sh who had the idea that I had not separated these clearly enough, that they mm. belonged in a kind of separate silo. Mm. Whereas I see them, again, on a continuum, and which is to say a continuum which, which blends and, and shades into the other, at, you know, at, at, the, at, the, at the margins. I mean, there is also a, you know, there is a, a universalist component in in American, doc, you know, Declaration of Independence. It's uh, a, a doctrine of uh, hum, human rights, natural rights, we would say for all human beings. So, you know, we have a, uh, you might say cosmopolitan dimension to American patriotism. And the same is true on the, on the other side. I, nationalism and patriotism grow out of a kind of similar um, desire, as I said, kind of what I think was kind of a natural desire. I'm, that's a strong term, but I'll use it. Uh, you used it, natural desire to have one's way of life, one's culture respected and you know recognized, and let's say in the, in the world strong. And I, I think that's that's all to the good. Uh, I have no problem with that. And, and of course, there have been, you know, lib, liberal nationalism and, and patriotism do not, you know, they don't diverge as an analytical proposition. I mean, the 19th century, for example, uh, was the age largely of what we might call liberal nationalism. The great political leaders of the 19th century, you know, Lincoln, Metzini, Gladstone, others were all, uh, sort of, you might say, liberal nationalists. And, and that's a position which still exists. Uh, Isaiah Berlin, the famous English philosopher, made uh, was a kind of liberal nationalist. It was something he endorsed. Uh, Berlin's student, uh, Yuli Tamir, the Israeli philosopher, uh, wrote a fine book uh, called Liberal Nationalism, which is in many ways very not so different from what I'm arguing patriotism is. But I do want to say that there is a tendency, both an historical tendency, as well as I think a kind of conceptual tendency that nationalism is more than a desire to maintain you know, one's way of life and making sure it's respected and strong. It's, a, it's, it, it, it's ultimately, I, I feel, a militant ideology or a militaristic ideology that sets one, one people against another. Uh, America first, for example. Right. One, of the, one of the points I make in my book is that patriotism, again, is a species of loyalty. 
like nationalism and to like nationalism too, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like loyalty to family. But here's where the difference lies. Uh, my loyalty to and love of my family is not predicated on the belief that my family's better than your family. I mean, it would be a preposterous thing to say. Uh, we'd not only be preposterous because, you know, we love our families, not because they're the perfect family, but because you, you might say because of their fault, not just despite, but often because of their faults. Uh, our love of family comes with a sense of, of, our, of our deep imperfections. And it doesn't make any sense to say my family first, you know, we have certain moral preferences, of course, for, you know, I talk about this in the book, I have a natural preference to see my child uh, get into a good school, succeed in life, get a satisfying job, raise a family of himself. But that doesn't mean that uh, I look at my child and my child's well-being as the you know, enemy of every other family and every other child. I, I read a statement the other day, which very much amused me because it's sort of the opposite of what I was saying that great wit, uh, not a great writer, but a great wit, American wit, Gore Vidal. Gore, Gore Vidal said, every time a friend succeeds, I die a little. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, you know, that kind of, it's me and them, you know, uh, it's very honest in many ways, uh, but, uh, very funny. But uh, that's, that's not what, what patriotism is about. And that's where I, I think I, that's where I, 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 I want to draw lines. They do, sh these things do shade. They're not, these are not logically yeah. airtight categories. Yeah, I, I do. I do want to push a little in the other direction, though, because even as you're saying now that um, it doesn't require absolute preferences, this is a a uh, very patriotic book in a, a narrow sense, insofar as you do insist that America is different and special, and American patriotism is different and special. Uh, and you, you touched on that when you talked about principled patriotism. You also call it enlightened patriotism. It seems to me, someone might argue, what you call enlightened patriotism is really only possible in America, insofar as we are a nation you know, based on certain universalist principles like the Declaration of Independence. Um, doesn't that point a little bit? Then it's not just like, you know, there's the phrase, a face only a mother could love, implying that mothers love very ugly people, uh, despite it. Uh, in this case, it's uh, America is worthy of special loyalty because of this, um, this rootedness and, and these universal principles. No, I think I, I, I don't disagree with, with, with that at all. Uh, I mean, when I think of, uh, I mean, I do think of, there are other countries that uh, I'm thinking of France in particular, which, which thinks of itself as based on a certain kind of, you know, moral universalism. And that's been a, a it's a very large, large part, their own republicanism is a very large part of, of French identity. They, they understand it differently than we do. Uh, I admire French republicanism very much under attack these days, probably been reading a lot about that. But, uh, you know, one of, I have about three pages I, I devote to who I think is one of, was one of the great, one of the great French patriots, Charles de Gaulle. Uh, I am a great admirer, not unqualified, uh, he had great faults, but uh, De Gaulle represented to me a certain kind of noble republicanism in, the, in patriotism in, in France. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, we are unique. I mean, I mean doesn't mean, again, we, we're, we exist in a kind of silo. We, our, our patriotism overlaps and shares qualities with, with, other, with other people. We, we, we've obviously learned a lot from Great Britain. Uh, and I talk a fair bit about that in the book. Even our language of patriotism comes from England. Uh, and in fact, patriotism, I, one of the things I discovered in the book, uh, I have a section called English speaking patriotism. Patriotism is a kind of newcomer to the English language. Uh, Shakespeare, uh, to take one example, uh, who I believe is believed to have the largest vocabulary 
uh, of any English speaking writer. In the entire works of Shakespeare, the terms patriot and patriotism do not appear. They, they were not words, or they were not, again, significant terms in the time of Shakespeare. It's in the 17th century, in the period when, you know, England was thinking about republicanism and they had a kind of ill-fated experiment with republicanism that the language of patriotism begins to enter the English speaking language. And, you know, in that form, it comes, and this is a story, of course, very well told by Gordon Wood and many other fine historians, you know, it's in that form that the language of patriotism makes its way across the Atlantic. And the patriots become, and as we all know, in a revolutionary period, Americans divided themselves between Tories or, or loyalists and patriots. What did that mean? Patriots wanted a republic. The Tories were happy to be part of the, the British Empire. Uh, the Tories found a home. They went to Canada. Uh, the patriots stayed here. And therein lies the difference today between the US and Canada. You know, uh, so, Patriotism in many ways, the, the term is, is in many ways, the term is an ancient one. It goes back to Greek and Latin, but English speaking patriotism re remains a, a relatively modern phenomenon going back to only really to the 17th and 18th centuries. I think I kind of got off. <laughs> That's all right. your, thought, your thought caused all kinds of other I do want to I do want to try to bring in as many of the participants. We have a lot of uh, questions already, so I'm going to try to um, see how many we can get to you. Um, first, the answer is much shorter. So, so, <laughs> uh, so um, Heather Wilford has a question, mm -hmm. um, and if you want to go ahead, Heather, uh, ask away. Thank you. Um, can you, yes, okay, you can hear me, I believe. Good, uh, thank you very much for this interesting thought-provoking presentation. Um, I originally was going to ask uh, something along the lines of what Tom first asked, so to press you on this possibility of liberal nationalism that you spoke about with reference to Herder, but maybe I could take this in a slightly different direction, building on some of what you just said. Um, mm -hmm which is to ask about the role of the nation or the nation state in your view of patriotism. Are we, what we're looking at seems to be a loyalty toward a nation mm -hmm. or a nation state that you are celebrating in the, in, in the right um, spirit and with the right qualifications as patriotism. And am I right about that? How does, how does the nation play a role in your understanding of what patriotism is properly. And if it is the nation that our loyalties are directed toward, toward do we wanna, would we, would we correctly specify this as a national patriotism? Yes, yes uh, we, we would. I mean, I accept, uh, you know, there are many people in Heather and I first, nice to hear you hear from you. Uh, it's been a long time, at least, <laughs> at least 24 hours, but uh, nice to hear from you. Uh, I, I, I do accept the, the moral uh, importance of states. I, I believe, you know, I'm a, I'm a Westphalian. I believe that the uh, states, the modern state system is the basis of political legitimacy in, in the world. Uh, and while this is contested and contestable and so on, it's, it's the premise from, from which I begin. So our patriotism is, na is national patriotism. Uh, you know, it, I, I accept a world of borders and limits. I think that's important. Uh, and yet uh, I, I, I'm, not quite, I, I'm unwilling to go to, to say that we live in a world of nation states does not necessarily mean we are driven all the way down the rabbit hole of modern day nationalism, which is an ideology that grew out of the nation state. But in many ways, um, has not has not has not always been a part of the it is not a necessary part of the American experience. I mean, when when did we start speaking about ourselves as the nation? Um, the more familiar term used in the early part of our history was a union. 
to establish a more perfect union. And union was the term that was used uh, throughout most of our early history. Uh, Lincoln turned to the term nation. He uses, and of course, union was very much part of Lincoln's early political language and remained part of his language. But he, in, in the Gettysburg Address, he speaks of a nation, it's nation under God he talked about. And of course, nationalism arose and you know developed. You know, interestingly, one of the things we don't. And I'm going to end on this. Just a historical kind of. I, I don't think something we don't get pay enough attention to. If you want to know where nationalism has its source in American political thought, it really is a product of the Progressive Era. And I don't say this just to take a cheap shot at progressivism and that sort of thing. But uh, for those who want to endorse nationalism today, and of course there are many, uh, you better take another look at the progressives because they are the true inherit, they are the true kind of users or the, 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 the creators of the, uh, they didn't like the old, federal, the old federalist system, thought it was what led to the civil war. We need a, a strong nation we, and, a, and a nation needs a state and a state needs a leader. And I uh, don't, you know, that, you know, that, that path you, you go on to. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at, at that. Great. I, I want to uh, descend from the heights of Westphalia to more uh, contemporary concerns to get a couple of these uh, questions. And here's one uh, from Craig Smith. How do you see patriotism functioning in today's society given the 1619 Project's view that the founding ideals were false and the 1776 report's glorified interpretation? Can patriotism be a uniting principle? I know you do, um, just in my own words, I know you address in a page or two the 1619 report, but um, what are your thoughts on, on this? Great, uh, thanks for, uh, Craig, thanks for bringing that up because I think this is a tremendously challenging and deleterious influence on any conception of American patriotism. It's not only an example of kind of blame America first, but you know that America's original sins and are kind of scapegoating, you know, the the whole record of American history, um, which is a tremendous project. Uh, you know, the 1619 project sees itself clearly as a way of educating, you know, high school students and others. This is a very bad turn, what to say, it's a very bad turn. And uh, while the book was, um, I do talk about this briefly, talk about the 1619 Project in the book. Uh, obviously the major part of the book was written long before it, it was there, but um, one of my goals, I, I hope, I don't know, you know, the, the 1619 Project has the New York Times behind it. So it's got, you know, it's got a battleship full of ink, you know, to support it. I've only got Yale University Press, what can I do? Uh, but I really think it is an ideological project that needs to be resisted. And I, I hope my book might be able to get a few followers along with JMC to push back against this, this, this what I call counter narrative of, of American history. I've actually just for the, just to add a footnote to it, I've, I've actually just written a, uh, an op-ed piece mm. called B Biden Needs a Sister Soldier Moment. And <laughs> I don't know if that term sister soldier will mean a lot to younger people. Maybe, it, maybe, it's, maybe it's universally known, I don't know. But I thought that uh, I think Biden should uh, take a swipe at, at, some, at some of this very uh, cancel culture stuff on the, on the far left. Can I, uh, just to, I think this next question, I'm going to ask this one because I think it's related to what you're talking about now. Uh, Emma Hall, a uh, PhD student at the University of Warwick, UK, mm -hmm. says, you mentioned the role of the Pledge of Allegiance in schools. How do you think this unique kind of patriotism can be encouraged or protected in the U.S. education system? Um, so, yeah. 
I wish Emma, thank you. I wish I had a I wish I had a good answer to that question. Uh, I know, think it's to support the Jack Miller Center among the others. That would be one. That's certainly a good. That's certainly a start. But I mean, that's throw that out there. Go ahead. Older, if you mean that's kind of for older, you know, by the time you're in grad school or something, uh, you you have to start earlier in a way, uh, and you have to, um, you know, like anything. One of the things I argue that is, again, I, unique may be too, too strong a term, but you know, we're, we're not, patriotism is not in our DNA. We're not, we're not born with it. It has to be taught to people. It has to be taught um, in the words of that famous song from South Pacific, it has to be taught. Uh, it, 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 patriotism requires teachers and teachers require texts. So the best way of, and I can think of, you know, if I, if I were, you know, czar of education or something like that, or chancellor of education is making sure kids get some kind of access to primary documents and the, um, the, the, the basic texts of the American, or in your case, if you're English, you said Warwick, uh, the British experience, uh, because these these shape these these texts, and not not just formal, uh, you know, political texts, but I think patriotism is is much taught through our literature, as well as through our as through our philosophies or through our through our theories. It's it's grounding students in the literature of of America and what what it is to be an American. That was a that was a goal of, of college education until not that recently, uh, or until what do I want to say? No, I, until fairly recently, uh, where the goal was to produce uh, students for public service and to give them the kind of moral and literary and historical knowledge that is required for a life of public service. That was sort of the old Yale at its best. It produced students like this. It really had, saw itself as a kind of national mission. It wasn't an ideology. It wasn't about indoctrinating people into an ideology, but it was providing them with the tools of an educated mind. And that would be um, one devoted to a kind of national or public service. And we've lost that. It, it's, not just a, it's not just a feature of the 1619 project. Uh, although it's part of it. We, we don't teach people, uh, we teach them to be, uh, I, I, let, me, let me not go, I, we have other questions, but uh, there, there, are, there are other forces, powerful forces in our education mm -hmm. system that, that, that make patriotism harder and harder to, to get across. Good, um, another, politically charged question. Um, this is from Dallas Terry. The men who stormed the Capitol on January 6th uh, thought they were patriots. What types of patriots were they? Mm -hmm. What are the implications or ramifications for this version of patriotism? How will this affect the possibility of regeneration of true patriotism? Well, so, this is one, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dallas. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I think at one point on, 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 on January 6th, there was a call by one, one of the rioters. He said, you know, patriots to the front. Uh, of course, every, everybody there on that day, if, a, if asked the question that Lauren put up on the screen before, are you a patriot? I have no doubt there would have been 100%, uh, you know, 100% yes. Uh, and, and yet one of, one of my, points of my book is that uh, patriotism is not expressed in the desire to overturn the results of an election just because you don't like the result. Um, that is, is not patriotism on, on my definition of the term. And I think by a kind of normal defi defini definition of the term, uh, in fact, it had more to do, I would say, uh, the events of, of, um, of, of January the 6th 
uh, had far more to do with the events of the winter of 1861 than they did with 1776. 1861, when, southern, when <clears throat> seven southern states seceded from the Union because they didn't like they didn't like the result of an election. Uh, and that's essentially the spirit of what I saw on the 6th of January. Okay, we had a, an emailed question from uh, William Higgins at Boston College. This is a very typical Boston College question defending Socrates. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, in your introduction to the cosmopolitan idea, you say that this idea, quote, runs deep in the Western tradition and is even very much present in Plato's Apology of Socrates. And uh, Mr. Higgins citing Apology uh, line numbers 30A, 1 through 4, and 30E, 1 through 2, uh, <laughs> but, uh, goes on to say that Plato Socrates says that he will go about questioning everyone who professes to care about the soul, but especially his fellow citizens since they are closer to him in kinship. He also climbed, uh, uh, claims that God has assigned me to this city. Is this not patriotism? Is it really so clear that Socratic philosophy favors cosmopolitanism over uh, patriotism? Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I discuss Socrates again in the book later on where I talk Freedom. about patriotism and resistance. Uh, but patriotism, is, I mean, excuse me, Socrates, as you know, is a very, very slippery character. Uh, you know, in the Crito, he, what, what, what text is more patriotic than the Crito, where he professes a kind of humble obedience to the city that has made him and has shaped him. And it would be like disrespecting his parents were he to, you know, disobey even one law, you know, this, uh, this, uh, kind of almost Uriah Heap-like, you know, obeisance to the laws. While in the apology, he has no problem with expressing a kind of proud defiance to his fellow citizens, declaring that their lives, because they're unexamined, are not worth living, that only he knows, you know, the one true way of life based on Socratic philosophy and reflection. So he, you know, he, he wants, you know, it, it, obviously the, the dialogues are brilliantly constructed to, to bring out exactly this tension between uh, what appears to be the, you know, patriotic and side of Socrates with this, uh, with this new critical spirit that he, in, introduces into into the polis and, and, and into Athens, and I would say uh, you've got a great uh, you've got a great dissertation topic there. I hope I hope you're writing it. We are running low on time. I'm going to try to get through. Uh, hopefully, we can get through a couple. Maybe we'll we'll run a little bit late. But um, so let me introduce one from someone that appears to know you. This is from Turku Isiskel. Is it? Oh. Siskel. I apologize for not uh, pronouncing your name properly. He says, uh, hi, Stephen. Is it morally permissible to be a patriot if your country is not, as Burke put it, lovely? Some of us come from countries that have committed genocide, ethnic cleansing, and systematic repression in recent times. Do we have to be patriot? What do, do we have anything to be patriotic about? Arguably, this applies to the American patriot too. How can we celebrate the good without glorifying the bad can patriots pick and choose what they are proud of? And um, if you want to look at, he thanks you also. Uh, he said, uh, if I was able to guess the answers to all the quotes that you read out at the start, it was that uh, it was thanks to having been your student and teaching assistant. Thank you. <laughs> if I remain, that I remain a cosmopolitan is entirely my own fault, of course. Sure. You. So I'm honored that you would be here and your question, of course, really is always really gets to the nub of the matter. Uh, thank you so much for the question and for your, for your kind words. Uh, you ask a great question. And of course, uh, today we are probably more, you know, we live with constant awareness of the sins of the past. Uh, our, our, Way, way, have way heavily on us, and certainly, I mean, one of the claims against patriotism that I address in the book 
is that it, it, you know, that patriotism seeks to whitewash the sins of the past, only emphasizing the good, not, not recognizing the bad. Um, and that would not, that's certainly not my view. Uh, I don't believe uh, we, we do that. And as I said at the beginning, you know, patriotism not only has to come with kind of pride in your national accomplishments, but a feeling of shame at our failures and our and our failures to achieve our 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 bet what what is best in us and this is why patriotism is not an it's it's a more difficult disposition i think than either the nationalist or the cosmopolitan the nationalist has no problem my country right or wrong america first it's very simple the cosmopolitan similarly has a kind of simple view of oh, the, the nation as we are, are we we have to work for global interests and causes. Patriotism requires us to hold a balance between these two sensibilities of both pride in, in, in what we are and what we have become, but also a sense of humility at our failures to achieve that. That was written into the first, you know, into Winthrop's famous City on the Hill sermon that uh, we are sitting on the hill, the world is watching us, you know, uh, mm. we, we, we exist, you know, we are living under, what an extraordinary thing to say, 1620 in the middle of nowhere, it says the world is watching, watching us, a uh, handful of English settlers in, in a new, new world for them. But they were aware that, you know, the world was watching and we have to be careful with, with how, we, how we behave because, because people, and mm -hmm. so I think it is a question of holding those, those together. And I think that's as true here as it is in Turkey. So God bless you. I really loved your comment. I, I want to introduce um, a, a related question. I'm going to uh, edit a little bit. <laughs> for the purposes of time from Bartholomew Sparrow. He asks, does the ability to feel shame at past injustices, uh, uh, is, that, is that a helpful distinction between patriotism and nationalism? I think it's related to what you were talking about. Because uh, I think you had begun, again, this is my own words now, you had made that gratitude and shame are somehow the important passions or sentiments related to patriotism. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Pat. Great to, I wish I could see you, but uh, thank you for, for joining us today. Bat was also my student many, many years ago. So great to hear, hear from you. I think, you know, a sense of shame and humility are important aspects of patriotism. It prevents the kind of arrogance of, you know, kind of America firstism uh, and the sense that we, we have to be aware of our failures, uh, which are certainly very real. You know, no country is perfect. I think what I especially dislike about the kind of whole 1619 project is it, it just, it's a project of, you know, wallowing in sin and wallowing in, in, in misery and failure. It, it so disrespects the generations of Americans, black and white, of, of all colors, who have striven to make this a better country, who have made us a more inclusive and a better country. And by rooting us in these ideas of kind of ineradicable racism, and, and, and it, 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 it's, it, it, it makes any attempts of reform and, and improvement in a way impossible. And I think it's very important to carry with us a sense of humility and shame, and yet at the same time, not let that, that's again, just one another side of, of sense of pride and gratitude for, for who we are. So I think these are very much part of a single whole in a, in a, in a certain way. Thanks, Pat. I think that might be a good place for us to close. Um, it does seem like that's a difficult, it takes, uh, it takes character to be able to balance those two things of gratitude and shame. Yeah, it's something to work for. But um, we're very grateful that you uh, joined us today. I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I'm grateful also for the uh, attendees and 
the uh, people who asked questions. Uh, thank you so much for a great event, uh, Professor Smith. Can I just say once again, Tom and Lauren, uh, thank you so much for organizing it and to, and to all, the, all the attendees. I'm, I'm honored that you would spend some time with me and my ideas. Thank you. Thank you.